much for us. Wow, look at all these people gathering. Hello, Anna. Hello. Hello. Hello, all. Nice to see you all. Nice looking group. <laughs> nice to see you, Brenda. Thank you. It's nice to see oh, you. Oh, John. Somewhere in the picture. <laughs> that fan blowing on. Wow, look at this. I can't. Yeah. 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 Hi, everybody. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Hi, can you see where I am? Where are you? I'm in headquarters, right by the tea table. There's no tea or cookies here. What's going on? <laughs> I wish you all were here. Because you're not showing up. Oh, no? you don't see me? Help me, Tom. I see you, Betty. There you go. Okay. Well, I'm everybody here. controls that on their own, so I can't help uh, you there. Yes, okay. we see you. Um, I love seeing all of you. Love seeing you, Betty. Jeff Bailey, why aren't you at work? I am at work. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Those that want to, if, if, my, if, my if, son. <laughs> if, if everybody wants to see you, they could click on speaker view and it would just be you. My techie is here if I need any. <laughs> you sure look pretty, Betty. Thank you. Guess what? The sun just came out today for the first time right now. Oh, my gosh. Someone says they can't hear you. They need to turn their audio on. I'm on. I can hear you, but the person who can't hear you needs to make sure their audio is turned on. Yeah. In your it's, lower left-hand corner, it should say start audio. Thank you. Did that work? Here's something. We hear you. Who's under us? So in another minute or so, I'm going to <coughs> mute everybody except for Betty. Um, and then <laughs> we're going to uh, do a little screen share of the presentation. Thank you. 
Hello, Ken. What? And your whoops, everybody disappeared here. So I'm going to start with muting everybody. And then I'm going to unmute. Betty. Thank you. The light on the light on him. Ta-da. There you are. Okay, I can read your lips and see your hands. So, hi, everybody. It is so good to see your faces. Golly, I miss you in this very room. Oh, my. It's 3 o'clock, and as I said, um, I'm here in headquarters. There's There are no cookies or tea. Thank you so much. But next year, we'll be here. We'll be here, won't we? Um, welcome this afternoon to Chautauqua and our magical history tour with some mystery. The world was alive in the 1870s with an excitement about learning, religion, travel, new inventions, and all that was beginning to be celebrated in this place. It was the Gilded Age, much to be discovered. My talk today will be about the interweaving of the disciples of Christ's presence here at the very same time that Chautauqua was beginning. Large numbers of disciples were in this region, many churches here and in Canada. I mean, really big churches. The Civil War was passed. This was another new beginning. You may remember Disciples of Christ at our beginning at the Second Great Awakening at Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801, led by Barton W. Stone. Then later with Alexander Campbell, and there he is in this ruin, portrait right there, uh, Alexander. We merged in 1830, 1832 in Lexington, Kentucky. We were a young denomination then, but a denomination, as Bishop Robinson said so well on Sunday, for such a time as this. In the beginning, Tom, are you ready, Tom? Uh, yes, ma'am. Here we go. Okay. okay. In the beginning, you did not see this. Hang on just a second, Betty. <laughs> you didn't see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> the suspense. It really is a beautiful time to be here. Miss you guys. In the beginning, you did not see, uh-oh, you saw it for a minute. This, you did not see this. This is the way we looked in 2019, the last time many of us were together. These are two houses, the one on the left just completed and lived in for the first time, and the one on the right headquarters house where, I'm st where I am today. Both pictures provided by John Peterson. Thank you, John. In the beginning, our only 
house looked like this next picture. This is a picture of our founding mother, Sarah Grayville's home at 9 North Lake, Fairpoint, New York. That was her address when she built the house with her two daughters, Adelaide and Catherine, in the late 1880s. Since they were from Buffalo, this was a convenient location. And I have always believed a reason Chautauqua was so successful back then, there was no air conditioning. And because of the altitude, it was much cooler here than in the cities. This watercolor was done by artists and disciples of Christ's hostess, Audrey Rittenhouse. She served with her husband, Bob, nope, um, that's not, yeah, nope, 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 go way back there, just stay there. Um, served with her husband, Bob, as host from 1979 to 1991. Maybe some of you knew them. They were followed by Carol and Richard Pierce for three years. Then Jim and Dudley Seal, our mentors, thank God, and predecessors. They served as host from 1996 through 2000. The first thing I wanted to do when we began as host in 2001 was to locate Mrs. Grayville's house. She was our founding mother. I look forward to talking to Audrey about her painting of the house. Unexpectedly and tragically, Audrey died from a fall before the season opened. I set out walking toward North Lake, just past the bell tower, painting in hand to find number nine North Lake, now Chautauqua, no longer Fair Point as it was renamed in 1875. I could not determine which house, no house with windows facing the lake, no lawn reaching down to the lake, that looked like this picture. The painting showed a large lawn with a view of the bell tower and also this picture of the pier building coming up. Hundreds of boats came in every day or came in every week as this was the main tr transportation here before roads. And the lawn was where visitors pitched their tents while having church meetings at Sarah Graybill's cottage on the lake. What I finally figured out, and that's why I talk about mystery, there have been so many, what I finally figured out from the photographs that someone built a house in what looks to have been her front yard, her view of the lake, not the bell tower or the steamships, was now a couple of small windows to look out and a front door. And then I got to thinking to date, maybe she sold that lot for some money to build her house or to finance the disciples here. Then I went to her back door and it has a different address, Thompson Street. So I can't wait to talk to the owners and get inside the house now that I've discovered all this. Out that door, she was just a few steps from the sacred grove where all this preaching and teaching began. Men preached there, men preached there on tree stumps rather like the location here today being so close to the amphitheater for us. At the beginning, Fairpoint was the name of the 700 acres camp meeting grounds when it was first leased by our founders. Miller had to talk Bishop Vincent into it, said they took a long buggy ride to see it. Vincent was from the city and he believed that learning and education, which is what Chautauqua was all about, needed to be in the growing cities. But once Miller drove him out here, he was convinced. And Miller was um, a big deal in the Methodist church. And so he had some influence in the Ohio conference. So that time, at that time, Mrs. Grable could have built her house at Fairpoint. Miller, an inventor and industrialist and active in the Methodist conference along with Vincent, decided to buy, this, to buy this place in 1876 and the Methodist, from the Methodist Church and renamed it the Chautauqua Institution in 1879. Combination to come together to learn from each other. However, Miller did not want to see a place that taught, quote, destructive 
camp meeting, end quote. And aside, our denomination had begun not even 50 years earlier at Cambridge in Kentucky at a camp meeting for thousands called the Second Great Awakening, where many of the responses to the preaching there might not have been approved by Miller or Vincent, just saying. Right, again, right away, a gate was put up. At first, at first, not to keep the people out, but to keep people in. A story I saw uh, while I was, while it was still fair point. People paid a fee according to how good the preaching was. Well, that didn't work out so well. So with the gate, they locked people in on the weekend and you couldn't get out till Sunday night after all the preaching was done and you paid a flat fee for all the preaching, no matter what it was like. Now we are the community where you pay to get in the gate when the season is open and before the virus, you could come and go and move freely all season. I don't see Marley waving, so maybe my gate story is okay. Another story, and someone told me this one, that there was a man that needed to get out to preach, but he didn't want to pay the gate fee, and he crawled under the fence and then waited till late Sunday night to crawl back in without paying. Times were hard, I'm sure. <laughs> the gate in 1874 let you into the Chautauqua Lake Sunday School Assembly, providing a two-week outdoor normal school for Sunday school workers. A normal school back then is what you call this special school for teachers that had not been to college. Um, I have a theory about this one, although John Schmitz, whom I highly recommend as an archivist, uh, said this one wasn't true, but I think it makes a, a good story. I understand they built a college for these teachers to learn year round. And after the first winter, when it snowed 100 inches, uh, that didn't work. So they had to depend on the assembly all during the summer season. The assembly could teach people how to better use their leisure time through healthy recreation, guided study and worship. Purposes that co-founder John Vincent referred to as all about the Sabbath. They wanted a place where they could have assembly, learning, and preaching, where all the denominations could appreciate each other's differences and learn from each other. What an idea. It was a belief early on that alcohol, dancing, and other vices destroyed families. The WCTU and some strong women had its beginnings here, which I only realized recently was truly an attempt at the first spouse abuse program, helping women and children who were thrown on the street because of the spouse's use of alcohol. As we train teachers, not only in church information, they could return home to teach the people in their communities. This was the time following the Civil War, and much like now, our country was sharply divided. This was the time of the Gilded Age with much prosperity, but idle hands, idle minds are opening. People were eager to heal the divides. And this was a time when a high school education was not available for the average person. The talk was normal school where the Bratton Theater is today had the purpose of instructing teachers who did not have degrees in higher education. Normal schools were part of many colleges. At the end of the fifth season in 1878, John Vincent announced a year-round correspondence reading program to be called the Chautauqua Literary Scientific Circle, or CLSC, open to people of any age, sex, religion, or race. All were welcome. It quickly spread to other countries, especially because of many churches having missionaries. David likes to tell the story of his mother Lorraine, a young preacher's wife in the 40s, 1940s, who upon moving to a new church in Bowling Green, Kentucky, was invited to join a CLS, CLSC study club there. Let me be clear, CLSC is not a book club. It was for reading, study, and exams back then. Her group met every two weeks when she completed four years of study, paid her $1.25 dues each year, passed the exams, she received a large, impressive diploma in the mail. 
saying she was a graduate of the CLSC. Now, although she was a college graduate, for many, it was like a GED. Only many years later, when she and David's dad were hosting here in 1976 and 77, did she realize she had a graduating class, a banner and an alumni house right here. Back to the missionaries. This is where Mrs. Graybill comes in. Many denominations then had missionaries. My belief, since women could not preach in the late 1800s, we have the founding of the Christian Woman's Board of Missions. Any, do I see any heads nodding with that? <laughs> um, which gave women a voice. That is a whole other chapter in our history as we worked our way through racism at that time. Blacks, black women had a separate but equal board. By the late 1800s, Chautauqua was beginning Disciples of Christ churches all over this part of the U.S. and Canada. Disciples were truly on the frontier. One of the main purposes, though, was to send people, especially women, to India, China, Africa, Japan, countries all over the world, as missionaries. Quote, to save heathen souls. We had the good news and good intentions. And here's the reason I finally discovered why Mrs. Grayville was referred to in so much that I've read as Mother Grayville. She was the mother of a famous missionary from their church, Richmond Avenue Central Christian Church in Buffalo. From a young age, her daughter Mary wanted to serve God by becoming a missionary. She served 23 years in Harda, India, and lived to be 87 in her retirement in San Diego. So she did not retire in India. She had home leave for two years spending time at Chautauqua in 1891, but also fundraising for her return to India, where she left an orphanage, where she built an or orphanage and was the administrator until she left. Her mother was so proud that one of her daughters became a missionary. She would have liked to become a missionary herself, but mission programs only began after Mrs. Grayville was older. They were made to sound like rock stars of that era. When missionaries returned on home leave, they needed a place to stay. So one of the reasons disciples were eager to have a house on the grounds was to provide a place for missionaries to stay. As soon as we did have a house, we set aside rooms each season for missionaries to stay and ministers at no cost to them. When Mrs. Grayville's front lawn was no longer large enough for all the tents in 1885, next, uh, by 1885, Chautauqua began having services in an upper room at the Congregational House, now UCC. This is the house that's nearest the amphitheater. The Presbyterians and Congregational had congregationals had two of the earliest denominational houses on the grounds. I haven't looked at the dates on the Methodists, but I'm sure they were there too. Uh, that lasted for two years. By 1887, the institution began assigning, assigning leaseholds with options to buy for 100 years. Disciples were assigned the lot beside the Presbyterians, beside the brick walk, right across the newly built amphitheater. Um, do we have a picture of that lot? Yes, there it is. And this is not from our front porch, but from our next door neighbor, Meg V's front porch, and you can see back in the bushes there, uh, the Presbyterian house. And we would have been right down there, we front row and center on the brick walk and everything. Uh, it was across from the new amphitheater and the disciples bought a large tent for our meetings. They are finally, after 10 years, decided it was too close to the amp. At that time of the tent, we had our first disciple day and on that day established the association and the idea was to contribute money to secure a house for our missionaries and the rest of us. But it was all about missionaries. Another disciple day I want to just mention because I don't have any pictures about this, but I found in my reading I thought was interesting. I was in 1936, it was so hard that we, so large that we had to have it across the street at the golf club house. Um, at that time, there had been, each year, there was a, a, a preaching institute or religious institute, that's how we got the Hall of Missions, 
And that year for the week, um, Mary Bethune was invited to be here and she attended our Disciples Day. She was the founder of Bethune Cook, this is a black woman, the found, founder of Bethune Cook College, a black college in Florida. Uh, I thought that was a big deal. And from the very beginning, Barton Stone and Alexander Camel were opposed to slavery. Did you all know that story, heads shaking? Yes, no, no? Uh, Barton W. Stone got rid of his slaves that had been willed to his wife uh, by her family uh, while he was living in, while they were living in Kentucky by moving to Ohio so they could be free. He knew that if he let them go in Kentucky that someone else would buy them. So it's been interesting to follow the Black Lives Matter through our history as we can. We quickly sold our tent when we decided that uh, we had a rallying day in, 19, in 1892 where we raised uh, $900. Um, by coincidence, in, in 1895, the, board, the boarding house at 32 Clark became available in an estate sale for $2,800. It had been built on a boarding house in 1878 and was ready for us to use as a headquarters. Jeff, do the math. What would be the equivalent today, $2,800? Mm -hmm. I asked David to do that. You didn't do that, David. Uh, we quickly sold our tent and our leasehold to a Mrs. Golding who wanted to build a hotel on the lot. The hotel lasted until the 1960s, Meg V tells me. The hotel workers lived and ate in the house next door facing our new headquarters house. When they tore down the hotel in the 60s, we are so grateful the house across the street was allowed to remain. Nowadays, this is how people tell where we live. I just say, across the street from the house with all the little figures in the yard, every three-year-old knows where it is. Jane Book's house. And thank you, Jane, for being there all these years. No, not from then, but for all our years. This $900 that was raised from some was raised from our trustees to allow us to pay the $1,000 down in 1895 and the rest in 1896. One of our historians says that Chautau we have a lot of historians I've gone through and some agree and some don't. But now the one I'm believing in uh, said that Chautauqua has always had our founding dates wrong because 1904 was when we had the dedication of our house, but the Persian purchase was 1895. She also said we were living in it by 1897. Reconstruction of the house took place the next five years. On the inside, we had 13 sleeping rooms, a chapel, a reading room, a fireplace, a small kitchen, and a back porch. I think there were partitions in this main room because it's always looked like that the front was separated from the back for some reason. On the outside, the original wood frame built as a boarding house around the late 1870s. The architect and builder are unknown. In this picture of the house, in 1895, just months after our incorporation, the house was purchased from Wallace J. and Mary Ford, disciples members of our church in Hiram, Ohio. I hope that helped. It was built as a boarding house and a half. By 1902, the house was changed by the addition of a porch with cucumber wood pillars given by the Teach Out Lumber Company of Cleveland, Ohio. We really had some wealthy people in high places back then that had building materials. They were described as elegant elliptical pillars, which were floated down to Westfield from Cleveland, then overland somehow and brought up Chautauqua Lake by steamer. So there's the land between uh, Erie and uh, Chautauqua Lake that had to be traveled. Albert R. Teachout was one of the original incorporators and his family did much to restore the house for the disciples. The Teachout's additions overwhelmingly changed the front look of the house. And I quote from the information in the 2002 booklet when we were invited to be on the bird, tree, and garden uh, house tour. And this is a quote. The additions changed it from the former Victorian period to a new 
classical architectural look. From the brick wall, the changes were described as a new Greek revival style. However, the original Second Empire period style cottage, cottage with its mansard roof, eave brackets, dentals, and ornate cornice line lurks behind largely intact. So we just covered it up. Notice that, more of the same, notice that teach outs, two story columns, swell out to a maximum diameter about a third of the way up the shaft. This is called entesis and was done to give the columns enough visual weight so as not to appear weak in relation to the portico above. They were often referred to at that time as lordly columns in our earlier days. We surely made a statement with our arrival on the brick walk, didn't we? The house across the street on the corner that has, I call the Stairway to Heaven house, uh, you know the name, back in uh, the early 2000s, it was just a little cottage. And when it was redone by our friends, the Camdas, Andrew and Gail, uh, Gail is a designer, architect, and she chose to pattern their columns at their porches, just like ours. So notice that sometime when you see it. However, by the time we were invited to be on the house tour, some things had changed. Uh, we were told by the new host, as new host, that the main reason we were invited was because we finally cut down the ugly, enormous evergreens that covered up our front porch and had our property, property properly landscaped. We got the prize for the most improved award. Who knew? We really did. We got a big, big, big basket of flowers on our front porch that said the most, most improved. Thank you, Jim Mason at Misty Ridge for cleaning, cleaning us up. One thing Jim did not clean up in our front yard, in the next picture, was a pile of rocks. I discovered in my research recently that one of our hostesses, I think it was Joy Sala, and her husband had made a trip to England in the 40s or 50s where they were pleased to see Stonehenge. They returned to build a small version of Stonehenge in our front yard. Who knew all these years you didn't know right here. I guess the size of the rocks kept Jim and me from destroying all this history. But I cannot believe I never asked David to move them. He would have found a way. Not one rock was flat or level, duh. And every flower container I set there would usually fall off. Dear Kathy, finally arranged some bricks to make it level a little bit. And then with our porch, with our house tour, we had a look at our porch. That's the front porch at uh, headquarters the year after our house tour. And so here's the story. We were told by our board that our porch was not strong enough. We had, we're gonna have some challenges. It was not strong enough to hold more than 10 people on the tour. What were we to do? David and I had never done a house tour. Fortunately, Richard and Susan Webb, our antiques dealer friends, were there and offered help. <clears throat> Susan and Richard Wade, you're out there someplace. God bless you. They were amazing. Richard stood by the brick walk, and as guests approached, he invited them to be seated on the two benches there. The rest could just line up down the front wall, not on our porch. Then he chatted them up with amazing details about our house that I never knew until their group could enter, not pausing on the failing porch. When I took the group inside and began to tell them some quote, interesting things that the webs had probably helped me to write, I could overhear Susan in our dining room proclaiming the beauty of the morning glory wallpaper. She asked them to look at different views and describe what they were seeing. I looked, the V's back door, the Scots basil plants, who knows? She made it sound wonderful. We knew we were successful when we gained some of those first time visitors into lifelong Chautauqua. Visitors who had driven all the way from Buffalo just for the house tour. The picture of the porch reminds me of another time like that. And Kay Linda and I were reminiscing yesterday. It was our first year at Chautauqua. When we arrived, we went straight to the kitchen. We saw a dirt floor just like this. No floor, but dirt. I don't remember if it was Bob David or Carol David, our board chair and his wife, or Rosalie, Owen, or Ruth, our forever volunteers and board members, 
who assured us it was being taken care of immediately. And it was. Our present kitchen was added later, um, and I don't know when, 40s, 50s. I know Marie Weaver talks about being here when uh, we didn't have our current kitchen. And Mrs. Carpenter, one of our retired missionaries, hostesses forever, uh, would only allow you in the kitchen long enough to get some milk for your cereal and come out in this room to eat. And then you had to leave for the day, taking the rest of your meals at a cafeteria. And they were abundant on the grounds. No Wegmans or groceries, maybe. The present kitchen was, a back, was the back porch with a slanted roof, which you can still see. The floor was also slanted. One refrigerator repairman said he would not return until we had a level floor. Rosalie, Rosalie and Ruth probably took care of that too. As I said earlier, we wanted a house early on in order to have missionaries and ministers stay with us at no charge. They paid very little and in their, they were paid very little and in their retirement, uh, we wanted them to come here for us to show our gratitude for their work. We needed more space. In 1945, Mother Graybill saw an opportunity to purchase the Widrick House at 30 Janes, it was then, now 28, built in 1879, also on a lot and a half. So for our two houses here, we have three lots. It had been a cafeteria with rooms to rent upstairs. Workers at the tall house behind us, a hotel then, stayed there. Very quickly, funds were raised to take over the mortgage of $2,500 at, at 5%, $500 annually until the debt was paid. All this was done under the direction of the Reverend Franklin D. Butchart of the Glenville Church in Cleveland, Glenville Christian Church. He was serving as our president of the association at that time. He was the moving force wanting to honor his son who had served so well as a missionary in China. Yes, that's who this picture is that you've seen all these years in Grayville. You also may remember the Chinese scrolls displayed in the Grable dining room as, as with beside this picture. This young man, Dr. James Butcher, Reverend Butcher's son, was a hero in every way. He had become a very famous uh, disciple missionary who served in China for 25 years. He died young at age 50. All the while, it says, respecting Chinese ways. A true Chinese gentleman, he was called, and he was buried there. He was praised by the Chinese who came as far as 500 miles for his funeral. He was very innovative and respected the Chinese medicine uh, while doing his good work. When he died, his wife, also a missionary, remained there teaching. All four of their children were born in China. When she returned to this country, she continued teaching one time at Hazel Green Academy. I did see in his bio that he uh, did medical school at Cincinnati and then uh, worked in Kentucky for a while. So I got to find that the rest of that story. The funds to pay for Brotherhood House, Grayville's name at that time, and I wish I could have you preachers talking to me instead of sign language, because we were known as the Brotherhood. The title of our newspaper was the Brotherhood. That's where I got lots of my news. So it was natural to call it the Brotherhood House, not being sexist, that's just who we were. Um, the funds were in memory of Dr. Butchart's son. And this portrait now hangs in the new Grayville House parlor. The information about his life will be on the back and also in a notebook there. This is why we have always seen several relics from China sitting around the house, and they still do, thanks to Kathy. Research showed Mrs. Grayville's name on old blueprints of the property. However, her daughter Adelaide was the secretary and treasurer for the association from that first Disciples Day in the tent in 1891, when the association was formed. So it well could have been uh, Adelaide's name that was on this as the signer for a lot of things, but. Um, our CADC board did not change the name of the house to honor her until the 1990s. By then she had died, as had most of the memories of Dr. Butchard. Time passes. Now, if you look at this black and white picture of Grayville, you can see the similarity 
in the structure to our old gray bill. You see the, the Tom point at the peaks there. And um, what an architect we have. Thank you, Bill Lobsher, who lives near here. Bill did all the work on our new house pro bono. Much of it over and over as Kathy and I would change our minds on the design. What a dear person and thank you, Bill. David Shirey, picture should be next. There he is. David Shirey is, is shown here as chaplain for the week. See what you all are missing? Just saying. And David, I'm sure you're, go back to David. David, I'm sure you're aware that A.W. Fortune from Central Christian Church spoke on the big stage many times when he was president, especially when he was president of the International Disciples of Christ. So a long list of Kentucky people have been here in times past, and that was probably took longer than the eight hours we take to get here. The final pictures, Gray Bill last year again, and the bell tower. This is where it all began. And now the yellow statue, our blessing on the porch and in the yard. We welcome you here anytime. If you haven't been here before, and I'm speaking to people in our Sunday school class at Central, we have been blessed by all of you who have been here and looking forward to the others who may come. So many thanks for your faithfulness and support. But my main tribute is to Tom and Kathy Brownfield. They have been amazing. Feel free to clap even though they can't hear you. They have been the right people at the right time. Thank God, David and I could never have done this. Tom overseeing the building coming here in the winter with space heaters and headquarters to see that building go on that many of you were able to watch through the ice and the snow. Truly a miracle happened. Now the next miracle we need is to get rid of the virus so we can be back in the house next year. Uh, this was the year we were going to pay off our debts and finish the house. The house will be finished. So um, thank you, Tom and Kathy, for everything you do for us. Uh, there was a note at the end of this, how to check with um, the institution, the assembly. And if you look on the assembly for heritage lectures, and this is not the black heritage lectures, it's after that, you can go to John Schmitz and get much of the history that I've tried to compact today because John is a wonderful speaker and uh, talked all during the summer. Thank you all for listening. It's been wonderful seeing you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tom, are, do we have time for questions? Not that I'll know the answer, but maybe somebody in the room will. Tom? Tom may be signing us out. I may have used our full half hour. If you have any questions, text me, I'll answer. Well, we do have uh, uh, as much time as anybody wants, but I, I don't see any wavings. And uh, let me change. <laughs> There's a waving from Kathy Negro. <laughs> hey, Kathy. I want to I want to call out uh, the web, Susan and Richard. How did I do with the story? Un can you unmute? Can you unmute Richard and Susan? She's talking now. What, Susan? did a superb job as always Betty yes, and and you made the house and the property and our association with it come alive thank you but thank you again for saving us that crazy day I could just see all these people falling through the floor because they didn't repair the porch till the next year how dare they <laughs> you all were wonderful well thank you thank you thank you Betty that was You're wonderful and I would like to ask um, uh, uh, R Richard Hall to send us off, um, having oh. been with us this 
whole series of all five uh, presentations. I think uh, we've uh, enjoyed them and starting later this week, they will be available on our website and our Facebook by using our, uh, uh, our new uh, YouTube channel. Richard. Thank you, Thank Tom, you. for that. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Appreciated uh, so much. I've got some follow-up questions, but I'll just s send them to you at some point. Uh, Good. Just to, out of the curiosity about how how we came to be, I uh, I'm struck by a couple things. One is the reminder that that this whole thing, the institution and the disciples' presence, Mrs. Graybill's initiation, was all about uh, the creating educated church leaders. Sunday school teachers. Absolutely. And nobody expected, and, and, and at that point, they didn't expect those folks to come to Chautauqua and have a good two weeks and then go home and do whatever they were doing. They expected them to go home and use what they learned to improve the lives of children, of, of students, of the world, of proclaiming the good news of the faith. Uh, and I did, I've been thinking about that a lot this summer that I really like coming to Chautauqua, and we talk about it, how nice it is to get away from it, but we are, heritage-wise, we are called to take what we get, gain there and, and take it home. Uh, so that, yes. that's that's significant thought. The other thing I reflected on as you were sharing was, uh, you said, I don't remember which house, maybe it was, it was the Brotherhood house we bought, and we had, it, we had a five, we had to borrow money, 5%, and had a $500 mortgage payment each year. Yes. Times change some ways. We still have a 5% interest rate, but now our, our annual mortgage, our annual payment is 50,000, not 500. How did so, I do, Richard, for queuing you up there? <laughs> okay. So that, 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 that just jumps out at me and makes, it calls me to remind all of us who are here what a blessing Chautauqua has been for us, how we're called to use what we've gained there in, our, in the rest of our lives, and that we are called to provide the financial support to make this whole experience possible. Uh, Mr. Miller was quite well-to-do from his industrial life. Maybe by comparison, we are well-to-do in our societies, and, and our folks have been very generous this summer, especially in light of the fact that nobody got to go this summer, and <laughs> enjoy the experience still that people have paid their room rents a number of people have just the same or part of it. So to those of you who have been contributors, thank you. If you've got some more, thank you again. Uh, and those who have yet to uh, step up, we're asking all of us to uh, help us through this difficult year financially as we move forward and prepare for the next year. So thank you, Betty. Thanks, Tom, for organizing these each week. And let me lead us in a closing prayer. Gracious God, who uh, set before us people who made a difference in the world through the Chautauqua Institution and through the disciples at Chautauqua, we give you thanks. As we've moved from a uh, frontier movement to a brotherhood, to an international church, to an interfaith community, we praise you and give you thanks. We give you thanks for Betty and for her leadership today. We give thanks for our experiences amongst the Chautauqua disciples and pray your blessing upon the work that we do now and evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for being here.